Good morning, everyone. We'll pick back up here in chapter three, hopefully wrapping up the chapter three slides with a little bit of time to start reviewing today. Um, I added this um, slide into the lecture slide page as just like a chapter three Avogadro's number where I filled in some of the actual numbers from the previous slide in our notes. So if you wanted to see this actual slide, it's posted. Um, but this is just coming back to the idea that we were like scratching the surface of at the end of lecture on Wednesday, that a mole is defined as an Avogadro's number uh, we'll talk a little bit more about other examples other than carbon, but for carbon, the way Avogadro's number was defined or determined was by counting the number of carbon-12 atoms precisely in uh, a 12-gram sample and sort of as precisely as we can make this measurement. And so this is uh, one of the most important numbers, so it's been measured out to nine uh, significant figures. And so we see that value here, 6.022140076. Not that you have to memorize it out to that many of digits, but that's uh, as precisely as we know Avogadro's number. And so that's the number of carbon-12 atoms precisely in 12 grams of carbon-12. So from that information, what you can do is you can say, well, what's the mass of just one carbon atom? So what's the mass in grams of one carbon atom? Well, if 12 grams is the mass of an Avogadro's number of those atoms, then just divide the grams by the number of atoms, multiply by one atom so the atoms cancel, that gives you then the mass of one single carbon-12 atom. So you see the mass of a single atom is really, really small. You're talking 1.993 times 10 to the minus 23 grams for a single atom um, of carbon, so the, the, the least divisible amount of atoms you could have in that sample for a single atom. And then the AMU scale, we might recall, was defined off of that carbon-12 atom. And so the single carbon-12 atom was used to define the AMU scale where we set this mass of this atom of carbon-12 equal precisely to 12 AMU. So exactly 12 AMUs is equal to that mass for that carbon atom. So we just say the mass in grams that we just determined a single carbon atom to have is equal by definition to 12 AMU. So what this allows us to do is to uh, determine our AMU to gram conversion factor, just a simple conversion factor. So if we divide both sides by 12, then we get one AMU is equal to about 1.661 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. Not a number I think you need to memorize. Um, also given on exams if you need it, but the other conversion factor, if you imagine dividing both sides, you know, you can always define if there's one gram is uh, 1,000 milligrams, you could say one milligram is 10 to the minus three grams, divide both sides by 1,000. So we can divide both sides here by that number. So divide both sides by that small number. So do one divided basically invert 1.6605-39067 times 10 to the minus 24. If you invert that number, then you get the conversion for one gram back to AMU, which is Avogadro's number, that there's an Avogadro's number of AMU in a gram. And so this isn't by accident, this is kind of purposeful. Okay, apologies. <laughs> now we got that out of the way. Okay, so we divide both sides by that small number or invert that small number, and then we come up with the number of AMUs in a gram, and it's that same Avogadro's number. And so let's make sure that we can kind of understand Avogadro's number outside of the context of carbon-12. So the number applies to anything. So you can have one mole of, uh, say, methane or any molecule you can imagine. So imagine you have one mole of CH4. So a mole of CH4, since now this is a molecule, this would contain 6.022 we can be more precise, but we'll round to four sig figs. 6.022 times 10 to the 23 CH4 molecules. So you can have a mole of a single atom like carbon, or if carbon's connected to four hydrogens each, in the case of methane, we can have a mole of CH4, in which case we have that Avogadro's number of whatever that thing is. That thing's a molecule. This is a molecular compound. So we have an Avogadro's number of molecules of that compound. And so if we had a sample of CH4 where we had a mole of it, we'd have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 individual molecules of CH4. So just a bunch of individual molecules. 
And so then one mole of CH4 would contain one mole of carbon and four moles of hydrogen. Because there's four H's per mole of uh, CH4, but there's only one mole of carbon. So we'd have within, if we had a mole sample of CH4, we'd have an Avogadro's number of carbon atoms. So we'd have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 C atoms in that sample. And then we'd have four times that number H atoms. We often abbreviate Avogadro's number with like number Avogadro. So Na is the symbol for Avogadro's number. So you could think your sample of CH4 has like five times Avogadro's number of total atoms. So you can think total atoms here. We have five atoms per molecule. We have a mole. We have five times Avogadro's number. This is nothing different than saying, you know, kind of like you could have uh, like 144 eggs, which would be 12 dozen of eggs. So you have 12 collection of 12 eggs. Um, that's kind of the same thing here, where the mole is a collection of a certain number, um, and it's a certain number of whatever that thing is. So you can have a mole of C, 6.022 times 10 to 23 C atoms. You can have a mole of CH4, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 CH4 molecules. So the mole, to me, it's one of the concepts that's not always well understood, but it's a pretty simple concept. It's just if you have a mole of X, you have an Avogadro's number of whatever X is. So a mole of H2, 6.022 times 10 to 23 H2 molecules. If you have a mole of NaCl, you have an Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 NaCl, maybe units, is probably a better way of thinking of an ionic compound. Okay, so let's think about then how um, this connection between grams and AMU uh, relate to things that we call like molar mass. And so we previously calculated the uh, molecular weight of C2H2 last time. This was where we took 2 times 12.01 AMU from the periodic table average mass of carbon, 2 times 1.008 AMU for hydrogen. So the molecular weight we obtained in AMU per molecule was, I think, 26.04. Now that's the, the atomic weight, or excuse me, that's the formula weight or the molecular weight in units AMU per single molecule. So when we think about molar mass, molar mass is grams per mole. So how might we calculate for C2H2, the number of grams per mole of that compound? You may already know the number. And if you're already saying, well, it's pretty obvious what it is, that's great. But if you're like, well, I'm not sure what the molar mass would be. Well, let's start with the 26.04 AMU, because we know how to get that from the periodic table from what we've previously discussed. And then this is the AMU per molecule, which we often don't write, but the understanding of the AMU, it's the mass of the single molecule in that unit. So it's the AMU per molecule, and then if we want to go to mole per mole, we just need to use Avogadro's number. So one mole of C2H2 would contain 6.022 times 10 to the 23 C2H2 molecules. And then we just need to convert AMU to grams. And remember, that's that simple conversion we just left off with. That's the Avogadro number of AMU. So one gram, Avogadro's number of AMU. So do you see how we're taking 26.04 times Avogadro's number, dividing by Avogadro's number? So of course that works out to be 26.04 grams per mole. So again, something that's so simple or seems so simple is often misunderstood is the connection between AMU and grams per mole. They're not equal to each other. But what we, what we can say is that the molar mass of a substance, the grams per mole, is numerically equivalent, has the same number as the AMU per single molecule. So the single mass of a molecule in AMU works out to be the same number in grams per mole. Now that's good because that means if we want the molar mass, all we gotta do is go to the periodic table just like we would a molecular weight. 
So we could have looked at this as AMU or grams per mole. So carbon's 12.01 on average grams per mole of carbon. And then hydrogen is 1.008 AMU or grams per mole. So we could have just taken 12.01 grams per mole times two plus 1.008 grams per mole times two. Once we know this fact that AMU and grams per mole have the same number, so they have the same connection to the information on the periodic table. So grams per mole, that's our molar mass. Now, depending on the problem, we might want to use, like if we're using a molecular weight versus a molar mass, depending on the given problem, we, we might write the units one way or the other. But it's very easy to look at the periodic table and work out either one of those two masses. So if I want the molar mass grams per mole of a substance, I'm just going to the periodic table and adding them up just like I would a molecular weight. And so then one last thing we might do is just then say, well, what's the mass of a single molecule of C2H2? Like, how would we determine that mass in grams versus AMU? Well, the one molecule mass in AMU is simple. That's the 26.04. So in AMU, it's 26.04. AMU is the mass of a single molecule. So it's really driving home the message that that is the mass of just one molecule of this compound. And then the number of grams we could determine for that substance, just that conversion factor, 6.022 AMU per gram. So of course the single mass of a molecule in grams is going to be a very small number. And that's 4.324 times 10 to the minus 23 grams. Now, if we think back to the size of carbon for a minute, this is just kind of relating to what we were talking about earlier of if you were to like lay carbon end on end, how far could you stretch it out? Or how many times can you make it to the sun and back? Remember that thought that we had? And so the diameter of a single atom of carbon, and the reason why I'm gonna talk about this here is I don't think I've used the angstrom scale, and I think I should talk about the angstrom scale just for atomic size. The diameter of a single carbon atom equals about, let me rewrite this somewhere else, let me write it below. So the diameter of a single atom of carbon is about three angstrom. Three angstrom is equal to three times 10 to the minus 10 meters, because an angstrom is just precisely one times 10 to the minus 10 meters. So it's like hydrogen's even smaller. The diameter of hydrogen is about 1.5 angstrom. Um, carbon about three angstrom, and so three times 10 to the minus 10. So think of how long you could stretch out carbon end on end if you had an Avogadro's number of these atoms. It would just be Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23, and then each one, like imagine each one's a centimeter. If each one's a centimeter, this would stretch out to an Avogadro's number of centimeters. Um, each one is three times 10 to the minus 10 meters, so we're just taking Avogadro's number times three to the minus 10, that works out to be 1.81. So these two numbers multiply together. 1.81 times 10 to the 14 meters. That's quite a distance. Um, that's uh, I think in the quadrillion range, because trillions 10 to the 9, uh, quadrillions 10 to the 12. So this is about 180 quadrillion miles, I believe, in that range. Um, and the distance of the sun is billions of miles, billions of meters, I'm sorry. Um, so, so this is how you're getting to the sun and back with carbon atoms laid end on end like 600 times for just one atom laid on top of each other. So it's kind of interesting to think about just how small a single carbon atom is how far you could possibly stretch out that sample um, just gives you a sense of just how small 
the carbon atom is and also how many of them there are in this relatively small 12 gram sample. So just that thought analogy, I wanted to show some of the math behind that and just also think about the angstrom scale a little bit here. Okay, so let's push forward into just using um, sort of uh, the gram to mole conversions, mole to particle conversion. So how do we make these conversions here? Well, the gram to mole conversion for a substance, this is using the molar mass. So if you know the mass of a certain substance, you can calculate the number of moles. We'll see some num numbers thrown in on the next slide. We can convert to moles of whatever the substance is to its number of particles, its number of molecules, its number of atoms. This is using Avogadro's number. And then we can go from particles to the number of atoms within the sample. Like you could say, and this is on the next slide, like if you had 100 grams of water, how many H atoms in total are in that sample? Well, you kind of need to go grams to moles of water. You need to use Avogadro's number to go to the particles of water, the molecules of water. And then you'd be analyzing saying there's two H and one H2O. Okay, so that's coming from the formula. So we can inspect formula to come up with the number of atoms within a certain number of molecules. So let's look at an example that kind of goes through the sequence here. So let's imagine we have that 100 gram sample of water. We could ask how many moles of water are present. That's easy, right? So that the water is H2O, so the molar mass, two, point, um, two, two times 1.008 grams per mole plus 1 times 16.00 grams per mole, so that's 18.02 grams per mole for the molar mass of water. So I'm just dividing by the molar mass, again kind of treating it like a conversion factor, one mole of water. 18.02 grams, so that's just a simple equality from the units of our molar mass. And I'm just dividing by the mass to get grams to cancel out, get moles up in the numerator. And so if we do that math, probably about five moles. I get many molecules of water are present in this 100 gram sample? Well, that's Avogadro's number. So if I have five and a half moles of water, what I need to think about here is one mole of water would contain an Avogadro's number of that molecule. One thing that's probably obvious is to make sure that you see that mole isn't the abbreviation of molecule. Those are two different thoughts, two different numbers, two different values. So the molecule is the individual entity of two H's connected to one O. And then the mole, of course, is the Avogadro's number collection of that molecule. So 5.549 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23. So that gives me 3.342. times 10, this should be a big number, times 10 to the 24 water molecules. So if I abbreviate molecules, I want to make sure to put mole C to make sure I don't confuse it with mole. So just make sure not to abbreviate molecules mole, that might confuse you. How many H atoms are there? Well, we'll just take the number of water molecules. times one H2O molecule contains two H atoms by this inspection of the formula. So right, if I had 10 water molecules, I'd have 20 H atoms. So if I have 
3.342 times 10 to the 24. I just have double that number of H atoms. So that's 6.684. Then we can even ask how many grams of H are present. in this sample. We could actually solve this a couple of different ways. In fact, some of these problems you could solve more than one way, but one, one way we could think of this would be to go back to the 100 gram and just multiply it by the percent H by mass. So we could go back to the 100 gram sample here and just multiply this by the percent H by mass, which you might remember, the percent H by mass in water would just be 2 times 1.008 um, grams per mole or AMU. It doesn't really matter here. Let me use AMU just to kind of connect that for the percent. It doesn't matter if you plug grams per mole or AMU. They're the same numbers. And then you're just dividing by the formula weight, also an AMU of water, so that's 18.02 AMU. So that unit cancels itself out. So if we take 2 times 1.008 divided by 18.02, that's the percent H in water. The remaining percentage by mass in water is the oxygen. And so this times 100, I'm just going to note the number, and then I'm going to solve it a different way. So the percent by H is 11.19%. Uh, I'm just multiplying that by 100 grams, so that's 11.18 grams calculated just from percent H from a topic earlier in chapter three. But I could also then just say, well, I could take this number of H atoms and convert it to grams. So I can take that collection here and should get the same number. Now, like what conversion do I want to do? Like I could do, I don't want to do grams per mole because I don't have mole. And I can use the AMU, so I can use 1.008 AMU per H atom. So that cancels out the unit of H atoms. Gets me in the AMU scale, not grams. So then I just need to do the conversion to grams. Avogadro's number of AMU in one gram. So I can take that 6.684 E24, so that's how many H atoms there are. It's 1.008 AMU per H atom. And then I can convert AMU to grams. So divide by Avogadro's number. And I get 11.18 grams, of course. So we can just get the collection of that number of atoms in terms of their mass. Now, if this was our only question, like if we said you had 100 grams of water, how many grams of H are present? I'm probably solving it this way. I'm taking the percent H, multiplying it by 100. Um, if somehow I have to do all these other steps, I may have just done it the way I did it in the very bottom of the page here. So there's a few ways we can, and a few problems we can connect to mass of a sample. Gram to mole gets us to moles. Molecules comes from Avogadro's number, especially in the formula, gets us to the number of atoms. And we can go either direction here. You know, we can. We can say if you had a certain number of H atoms in the form of water, how many water molecules are there? How many moles of water are there? So you can enter the problem from the left, from the grams, and go to atoms. You can enter on the right side of atoms and go to moles as well. So you can go kind of either direction here with these conversion factors. Okay, let me throw this problem to you guys here. Um, so today's lecture survey is empirical. So give this problem here a try. We were trying to figure out how many nitrogen atoms there are within this sample of magnesium nitrate. Give you guys two minutes or so.
You'll feel free to compare notes with your neighbor. We'll go another minute-ish. All right, let's, let's take a look here at this one. The, the one thing I think that could make this problem a little trickier is the fact we have an ionic compound and the verbiage or maybe some of the nomenclature is a little bit different when we think of ionic compounds. Like if I think of, you know, H, you know, I think that's an atom. I think H2, that's a molecule. When I just have one of them, it's, think of that as being a molecule. What about like NaCl or ionic compound? We could think of, oh, sorry, yeah, thank you. We could think of that as being maybe like a unit that NaCl is not really a molecule in the way H2 is. Like H2, you have the sample of H2, you have a bunch of H2 molecules that are separate from each other. If you have a mole of NaCl, you'd have repeating plus minus ions. So we tend to think of NaCl, maybe the better word here would be unit. You could call these all particles, though, is another word we could use. You could say if you have a mole of H, you have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 H particles. So the particle there is the H atom. If you have H2, a mole of it, the particle is the H2 molecule. If you have a mole of an ionic compound, you might have an Avogadro's number, number of that unit or that particle being the single collection of that empirical you know, NaCl, in this case, MgNO32. So I just wasn't sure if the MgNO32 is confusing here, but I hope it's not, because all we need to do is take the mass that's given and then take the formula to get the molar mass. So the 148.3 is just the mass of one magnesium the mass of two nitrogens, and the mass of six oxygen atoms added together. So we just have to make sure we have NO32, so two nitrogens, six oxygens, and the, the formula weight of that compound. So we can use the molar mass there. And then that gets us to the moles of MgNO32. And then the one mole to Avogadro's number, I would just say you have an Avogadro's number, you could call it molecule. It's not wrong, or it's not going to get you the wrong answer if you say MgNO32 molecules, but I would call it units or particles. So probably the word here, particles or units, is more you know, used when we have an ionic compound. And so then one unit is just the actual collection of one magnesium, two nitrogen, six O's, so one MgNO32 unit, two nitrogen atoms. And so that's the math there that I use to be able to get answer C. So this one here, again, it's just a slightly different example, but same basic problem that we were working on with water. Is that hand going up? Yeah, um, so should we always use 46 eggs for like grams per mole? Because I, I had like 148.319. I still got the same answer, like it was oh, just yeah. a more exact answer. Yeah, I mean, if we're either using at least three, if not an extra one, like the, the previous example is 100.0. 
I probably would have been better off going an extra sig fig on it on everything, but I just didn't feel like looking it up. And in my head, I was like, next time I'm just gonna change it to like 125 grams and get rid of a sig fig. So most lecture examples have masses to like three or four decimal places. So if you're doing molar masses to like three or four sig figs, you're gonna be just fine for exams. The only time you might need to be a little bit more precise is with lab where you have like those balances recording to like five total decimal places. Okay, so then the, the last section in chapter uh, three that we have to worry about for next week's exam is section five. And then there's two basic problems we're gonna look at here. Uh, and then there's a third problem presented in the book that we're not going to cover. So we're gonna look at percent mass of a pure substance um, leading to its empirical formula. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that on how we can look at percent mass data and from that get back to an empirical formula. Something from um, uh, Monday's lecture, I think it was, was where we were looking at um, the percent mass of a compound. I think we looked at the percent mass of two molecules that had the same empirical formula and saw that they had the same percent mass. So I think we were looking at CH2O over C6H12O6. Whether or not we looked at that example previously, but if you think about the percent mass of carbon in these two molecules, they have the, an identical percent carbon, percent hydrogen, percent oxygen. So if I were to tell you a compound has the percent mass of carbon, percent mass of hydrogen, percent mass of oxygen that these compounds have, the best we'll ever be able to do is determine the empirical formula. The simplest ratio of the elements is that empirical formula. The molecular formula we could get from additional analysis. So like let's say we knew the percent mass of the given atoms in a compound and we wanted to know a molecular formula, we'd have to then do a second experiment. So molecular formulas could come from a molecular weight empirical formula analysis. So two types of experiments are generally done here. One is an elemental composition experiment. We won't talk about what that entails, but there are ways you could take a sample that's pure and submit it to like a, an instrument that will sort of spit out or read out the, the percent masses of each of the elements in the compound from which you can use to determine that empirical formula. And then you can do a second experiment to get a molecular weight, such as a mass spectrometry experiment. So you can do a mass spectrometry experiment. That's a very common one that's done to get a molecular weight. So once you know the molecular weight, we should be able to then say, can we get the empirical formula? Uh, excuse me, if we knew the molecular weight, we knew the empirical formula, we can then figure out how many units of the empirical formula there are in the molecular formula. So like for this example here, there's you know, a multiple of six. So there's six of the empirical unit of CH2O and C6H12O6. So we'll see these worked out in some examples in a minute. So let's see these kind of ideas coming out in the form of examples. And then there's a third topic in this section called combustion analysis. We're not going to cover that at all this semester. I'll show you the last two slides in the lecture slides are kind of problems that look like that topic just so you can see what to avoid in the textbook so you don't spend time on those problems. Okay, so let's look at this first question here. So what formula is consistent? So like the, the, this problem here, we're gonna calculate the empirical formula and then we're gonna see that we can kind of rearrange the empirical formula into like an ionic compound that we might recognize. So which formula below is consistent with a compound that's comprised of this percent chromium, this percent carbon, and oxygen is the remainder. And these are the percent by masses of these elements in the compound. So we can say that we have 36.6 grams of chromium in ratio, the idea here that this is a ratio to 12.7 grams of carbon. And then the remainder, the sample has to sum up to 100%. So 100% would, would uh, if we then subtract the 36.6%, that's chromium, the 12.7%, that's carbon, that's our percent oxygen. So our percent O is the remainder, so the three percentages have to add up to 100, so I'll just take 100 minus 36.6, minus 12.7, that gets me 50.7%. 
and that's the percent O. And so these are all the percentages by mass. So I can get the ratio of these masses. So then the, empir so the empirical formula is the simplest ratio of the number of atoms in the formula, of these elements in the formula. And so if I have the ratio by mass, the question would be, can I get a ratio by mole or by atom? And then can I get a simplest whole number ratio from there? So why don't I try to convert these numbers to moles and try to relate the ratio of moles of these different elements and then try to get the whole numbers from there. So what I might do is try to calculate the number of moles of chromium that are in ratio to the number of moles of carbon And then I can start with these masses here. So I think one of the keys is that we're starting with the ratio of the masses. A lot of times the, the book or problems say, assume you have a 100 gram sample. I think that's a, a silly way to start the problem. I don't really want to assume any massive sample. I just want to use ratios of the masses that are true of the information in the problem. And the easiest way to come up with the ratio of this chromium to carbon to oxygen is just to use the percentages as masses. So it's really not even, I'm not really assuming a 100 gram sample. I'm just kind of trying to come up with, what's the easiest way to come up with a ratio of masses that are that are correct for these percentages, yes. So like, how, like how do you do that, come up with the correct ratio? Well, again, it's like if, if the ratio by mass is 36.6% to 12.7% to 50.7%, uh, if we assume the 100 gram sample, then you would say 100 grams, 36.6% is chromium, so you get 36.6 grams, and that maintains those ratios. Yeah, so then how do you get to the simplest yeah. ratio? Yeah, so what, you, what we need to do here is convert those to their moles. So what we need to do is go to, from grams of chromium using the molar mass of chromium, uh, 51 point uh, nine something, what's that say? 51.996, is that right? Or is that nine? Does the other room see that better? 51 point, is it 996? Yeah. Okay. And then carbon's molar mass is just 12.01. And then oxygen, 16.00. And then this will give me moles. They won't be whole numbers necessarily yet, but hopefully I can take these quantities and go towards whole numbers. could probably round the three sig figs here. I'm going to keep a fourth around just to maybe help me see the rounding later. So now I get these moles. Now again, these aren't necessarily going to be whole numbers. Um, what we need to then think is how do I get closer to whole numbers? Like how do I get you know, the ratio to trying to get towards the simplest ratio? Well, one thought could be I could use Avogadro's number. Like I'm not going to, I could, if I had maybe an extra 10 minutes in class, I might actually multiply all of these by Avogadro's number to say how many chromium atoms are there, how many carbon atoms are there, how many oxygen atoms are there, but we're multiplying them all by the exact same number. So it's not gonna change the ratio at all. So that's not really a, that useful of a step. And I can also even come back to, a, let's think of a simple formula like CH2O or whatever, that the ratio would be one C atom to two H atoms to, two, uh, to, to, to one O atom. 
but the ratio would also be one mole of carbon to two moles of H to one mole of O. So I don't really need to necessarily convert to a single atom here. I can leave these in moles. And then what I might want to do is say, well, the smallest the number should be here is one. Like the ratio shouldn't be lower than one. So let me divide by the smallest number. But I have to divide all these by the same number. Otherwise, I destroy the ratio. So I need to divide by a number here. And I'm going to start with the smallest number of the three. Just because that guarantees me having a whole number for the smallest value. So that I no longer have any numbers here that would be a fraction. And if I'm lucky, I'll be done. If I'm unlucky, I'll still have to consider some math after this. So this gets me to one mole of chromium, kind of precisely, since we're dividing the number by itself. 1.057, this isn't going to be a whole number. You can kind of see it. But hopefully we get closer to a whole number here. I get 1.50 moles of carbon. Now in ratio to 3.169 divided by 0 0.7039, that being 4.50. Again, start with the idea of ratio. So we start with ratio of masses. We went to ratio of moles using their individual molar masses. And then we had to find the smallest number of the three to divide all the numbers by the same number to keep the ratios intact. Just to try to get to, to a whole number ratio. And now the next thought would be, if we have whole numbers, we're done. If you're within about 0.05, I would round to the nearest whole number. We're not anywhere near whole numbers here. So then we have to think whole number multiples. Do I need to double all these number, num numbers? It's never going to be a fraction, right? Because if I multiply one by a fraction, that's not going to be a whole number anymore. So start thinking, do I need to double all these numbers to get whole numbers in all three spots? Do I need to triple, quadruple? Double works here. So I just start with the smallest multiple. So multiply all these by two. And that obviously is going to be two moles of chromium to three moles of carbon to nine moles of oxygen. So this is going to look like CR, either C3O9, or excuse me, CR2. I forgot to write the two in there. But CR2, C3O9, but C3O9 is probably carbonate, right? So this is probably something we could express as CO3, three of them for C3O9. So the formula that would be uh, in the compound that's likely would represent would be chromium three carbonate. So chromium three plus, carbonate two minus. So this looks like, you don't have to enter this online, so don't worry about feeling like you have to key this into Carmen or into that quiz. But Cr2, CO3, three for the formula, two chromiums, three carbons, nine oxygens. And so that's the idea of going from percent by mass. The best we can get to is empirical formula. If the compound's an ionic compound, the only thing we ever tend to represent ionic compounds with is their empirical formula. So this is a great technique for determining the formula for ionic compounds, because the best we ever get for an ionic compound is that empirical formula of its ions. For something that's a molecular compound that contains you know, CHO, non-metallic elements, this compound here, just C and H, the, the best we can generally do is the empirical formula from the percent by mass data, but we usually want to know the molecular formula. So I think we talked about before how the um, empirical formula, two compounds that share an empirical formula, they share nothing in common by that fact. You really want to know the molecular formula for a molecule. So here we get some percent by mass data. We also get a molecular weight. What's the molecular formula of the compound? Now, you can be clever in a lot of different ways to get the formula, but I think the way we tend to think of this problem here is step one, get the molecular formula, get the empirical formula from the percent mass data. And then step two, use the molecular weight to get the molecular formula. So let's work through these steps here or kind of show how we might set this up. 
Now, like I, I'm kind of alluding to, you could come up with other ways of this information to solve the problem, but the way we are kind of thinking of this is, step one, the best we get is empirical formula, and then from the second set of data, we should be able to get the molecular formula. So our percent C or percent H, so that's 84.4%, that would be grams of carbon in ratio to the 15.6 grams of hydrogen. So we just need to start with two masses that are, in, are true for those percentages. So really easy, just go 84.4 grams in ratio to 15.6 grams. And then, um, I don't know, why don't I turn this to you guys? This might be a little bit long, but you know, maybe take three minutes or so and see if you can come up with the formula. I'm trying to think of the step one, step two process here. I know you might be thinking, if you're, you're being clever, there's probably a faster way to solve the problem. But the way this is kind of presented is step one, step two. If you ever see this on a test, they usually try to like give you some data in a way where you kind of have to do it step one, then step two. My apologies if I'm going to rush you guys to kind of start going over the problem now. But just to kind of look here at the percent masses using the molar mass of carbon, molar mass of hydrogen, I got 7.027 moles of carbon to 15.48 moles of hydrogen. So I then want to divide by the smallest number, keep that ratio intact, so I'm going to divide both by the same number. I get one mole of carbon in ratio to 2.20 moles of hydrogen. So now that's not good enough to round to CH2. So I need to think, should I double those numbers? Well, that's going to be 4.4. For hydrogen, that's not a whole number. Times 3, 6.6, .6, that's not a whole number for hydrogen. Times 4, 
that's not a whole number, that's 8.8 .8 for hydrogen. If I go times five, that gets me to 11. So if I go times five, that gets me to 11 moles of hydrogen in ratio from five moles of carbon. And so we're just trying to come up with that simplest whole number ratio. In this case, it's C5H11. That was our empirical formula, the simplest ratio. And so then what I want to think is, well, what's the collection of masses from 5 times 12.01 plus 11 times 1.008? The empirical formula mass, just the molecular weight of that empirical unit, is 71.14 AMU. Well, let's divide that into the molecular weight. That has to be a whole number. If not, we made a mistake. If we don't get a whole number here, our empirical formula was probably wrong. Uh, but I get two, so that there's two units in the empirical formula in the molecular formula. So the molecular formula would, of course, be C5 times 2, H11 times 2, which would be C10, H22. The purpose of the um, Carmen quizzes is just to engage you guys in class. If you feel like you just want to get the answer right in Carmen, feel free to enter it. If not, whatever, not a big deal. Um, I'm just trying to gauge how many people are here, too, in each lecture. Um, so thanks to, to you guys for, for doing those when we do the um, Carmen quizzes. But for this problem here, this is how we kind of go in a two-step process. Get the empirical formula, get some more data, like a molecular weight, to get the molecular formula. Now these are the problems here. Like if you see a problem where we're giving you CO2 mass data, water mass data, a sample mass data, and saying come up with a formula, don't worry about that topic. We're not covering that this semester. So this topic here is called combustion analysis. You can skip those problems. I just had a problem here so you can kind of see, like I just want you to be able to recognize the problem to avoid it later. It's a problem where you're getting mass data of CO2 and water and ask for a formula. The only thing I might wonder if we could spend a minute or two, everybody last time was saying on the survey that it was naming that they were kind of most stuck on. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to look at this since and have gotten more comfortable, but um, I just thought we could look at a couple of naming things before we take off. Um, hydrogen sulfate, this, this ion trips everybody up, but this is just hydrogen added to phosphate. So this is H plus added to PO43 minus. So this ion here has a charge of two minus. So hydrogen phosphate is HPO4 2 minus. So I'm going to just erase these charges here. So I know HPO4, I don't need the parentheses anymore either, is uh, HPO4 is a 2 minus ion. And so then if I pair that up with sodium, then I'm going to need to have two sodiums. So I have a 2 minus ion. With sodium plus, I need two of them. So Na2HPO4. So that would be sodium hydrogen phosphate. Again, we're just trying to balance out the plus with the two minus. Chromium six oxide is chromium six plus. Oxide's a two minus, so I need three of the two minus ions to balance out. This is cesium plus one, that's an alkali, so it's plus two, O2 minus two overall. This is cesium, and that's peroxide ion. Peroxides aren't the most common ion and naming on exams, but see uh, the O2 with the two minus charge is peroxide ion. I'm kind of running out of time, but chloric acid off chlorate is HClO3. Methanol, just the, the alcohol of methane. Acetic acid, the acid of acetate ion, so that's acetic acid. Nitrous acid is based off of nitrite, HNO2. And nonanol is just off of the C9 hydrocarbon. So C9H20 for nonane, C9H19OH for known and all. So just a couple of review problems on naming. Bunch on the daily quizzes if you're still stuck on that topic. We'll pick up with the rest of the review packet in class on Monday. Uh, if you have questions over the weekend on anything, feel free to email me. I have office hours, 11.30 this morning till 12.15 and 2 to 3 p.m. today as well. Extra office hours Monday. See an announcement for that information. Thank you guys. Sorry for going a minute over. Good luck on the midterm next week. I'll see you again, hopefully.